So our uh, uh, scripture today, uh, our message is from the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Hebrews 12, verses 1 to uh, verse 3. <coughs> Using the wrong title. <laughs> okay, there are many verses in the New Testament describing the Christian life using metaphors or figures of speech. In Colossians chapter 6, verses 10 to 18, the Apostle Paul described Christians as soldiers. Christians are like soldiers fighting against the wiles of the devil. And within those verses, he also mentions a wrestler. A wrestler that, who doesn't wrestle uh, with uh, uh, flesh and blood, but against rulers and principalities and spiritual forces of the devil. Also, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16, the Apostle Paul uses a boxer. Describe a boxer who does not box as one beating the air. In James 5, 7 to 8, Christians were described as farmers waiting for the harvest. There are more metaphors or figures of speech that were mentioned like slaves, uh, bride and the bridegroom, like a father and the son relationship. But here in Hebrews chapter 12, uh, the, uh, the writer of uh, the book uh, uh, is talking about the Christian life using the metaphor of a race. Using the metaphor of a race. So since this uh, message is for Christians, we are the runners. We are the athletes. So we are running the race and we don't aim aimlessly. There are those who run aimlessly. There's no uh, finish line going nowhere. Just like jogging. There is no no, uh, no aim. There is no finish line. But uh, uh, the pastor John uh, MacArthur said the worst runner is the one running on a treadmill. He's going nowhere. <laughs> it's just there. <laughs> <laughs> so we run the race with the goal to finish it and to win the prize. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, he said, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the price of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And he said to First Timothy, before he died, he said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will reward to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Meaning all true believers who set their hearts on the return of Christ. So we as Christians are the most, are in the most important race of all. We are competing in the faith's Olympics. The question here is, 
How can we win the race? How can we win the race? Number one, we must look around us. We must look around us. We are all in a great stadium, like those uh, runners in an oval. So we are running the race. And the moment you became a Christian, you are running the race. You are running not a sprint, which is a short distance run, not a bus, the middle distance run. It is a marathon, a long distance race. So we are all in the great stadium. And Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great cloud of witnesses, let us, that's what the writer said. But before we go to those uh, he wants us to do, let me go back to the phrase, surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Since the word, therefore, was the beginning of the verse, therefore is a word that points us to what was already been, been said. Therefore is a connecting word. So the writer is referring to the heroes of faith in chapter 11. This is why chapter 11 is called the faith chapter. <clears throat> These are faithful in the individuals in the Old Testament that has been mentioned by the writer and he started it with Abel, Enoch, Noah, uh, he uh, mentions uh, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and so forth. There are, I think, 18 of them that were mentioned in uh, chapter 11. So after Joseph, it was Moses, Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, and Samuel. So these are the faithful individuals. But this cloud of witnesses may also include those who are in the New Testament, like Paul, Peter, James, John, and uh, so many more, like those who went ahead of us today, maybe like Charles Spurgeon, C.S. Lewis, Billy Graham, and so many more who have a great faith. So when the author of him the author of Hebrew mentioned the word witnesses, it may have mean a double meaning. It may have a double meaning. The verse says that since we are surrounded by so great of so great a cloud of witnesses, the word implies, the word the surrounded implies that they may have been around us, looking at us. Although the verse didn't say that they are looking at us. But nowhere in the Bible does it say that the saints in heaven are looking at us or they are uh, uh, around us. Uh, they are witnessing us. They are looking at us. But to me, it looks like it's the other way. It literally it is referring to their lives and their faith as a witness to us. They are not looking at us, but we are looking at them as an encouragement on how to live a life of faith. 
that's just my uh, perspective. I don't know about you. <laughs> so, many watches us and are counting on us to run well. In the stadium, when the runners are running, there are so many people watching around. So, we as Christians who are running, there are many who are watching us. <coughs> Maybe our parents, our families, friends, co-workers, even those people whom you don't know, but they know you because you are a Christian. They are looking at you. So what's up? You have to look around you who are watching on you. So some of, some of these watchers, some of them may enter the faith race because on how you run. Or maybe some may choose not to run at all. So what's the people around you? Look at that. Okay, so we must look around us. Number two, we must look within us. So therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, the writer said, let us lay aside every way. In the NIV, <laughs> which uh, Sister Debbie has read, it says, throw off everything that hinders. But I like uh, the first one, in ESB, which says, lay aside every way. Winners prepare to win. Winning is not an accident. Winners take steps that lead to victory. We, weights are used to get you ready for a race. Runners hold weights in the ankles or the legs when they train. Weights help <coughs> strengthen their muscles and increase their speed. So when they are in the actual race without those weights in their bodies, they feel lighter, and because they feel lighter, their speed increases. Not only on track and field, it's also in basketball. Michael Jordan, when he trains in his gym, in his mansion, in Highland Park, he said he always wear weights in his legs. Keeps on jumping, jumping, and so when he plays in the actual game without those weights, he jumps high. And not only he jumps high, if you notice, he sometimes he spins on the air. When somebody jumps with him, the other one was ready down, but he's still a little bit up on top. Because probably because of the weights that he put in his legs. The same thing also in baseball. I think I know, I think Pastor knows it. He put this donut ring on the bat, and when they are on deck, when they are the next one to bat, they keep on swinging the bat with the donut uh, ring on the on the bat. So when they are on the on, well, when they are now the uh, the one uh, to bat, he feels the bat is so light. So when he swings, he swings fast. So when he hit the ball, <laughs> home run. <laughs> so weights are used only when they train. They don't leave it when they are in the 
actual playing. They use it only when they turn. It would be a foolish thing to put that weight in their bodies while they are in the actual play. So winners don't run with heavy clothes. Winners don't carry anything that slow them down. It will hinder their performances. They lay them aside. They lay aside every way. And then the verse continues. They let us lay aside every way and sin with things so closely. Wait a minute. There are two things that were mentioned here. Weights and sin. If the weights, if the weights is if the weight is not a sin, then what it is? What is it? It may be our job when we are pre preoccupied with uh, our job. We do sometimes go to our Bible study. Sometimes we were tired with the work that we were doing and we don't go to Bible study or we don't go uh, to church. It may also be sports, like today, someday. It's football day. <laughs> Some people, they just don't go to church. They just stay home and watch the beers. The beers lost up. Not lost up. <laughs> they just sit with another foot on the other side, on the other uh, foot, and a beer on the right hand. <coughs> Those are just examples of uh, ways. It may be just watching the TV, movies on Netflix, or maybe uh, your time is on your children, nurturing them, and since uh, it's uh, weekends, they just prefer to be with their kids rather than to go to church. Those are just examples of weights. But I, I heard a preaching of a great preacher, John MacArthur, and he believes the writer of Hebrews is talking about legalism. Legalism is the weight that the writer of Hebrews has, uh, talking, has been talking about. So these are rules, traditions, rituals, ceremonies, and these are all good works. These uh, are ideas that can earn salvation by obeying them or doing them. It is considered a false teaching that misuses laws and laws. An example of legalism is observing the Sabbath. Colossians chapter 2 verses 16 to 17 says, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. Festival is a yearly uh, uh, law or rules that they obey. A new moon is a monthly and Sabbath is weekly. So these are the shadow of the things to come. But the substance belong to Christ. When I go Google the legalism, what are those uh, legalism, he give me this answer. It says, 
Legalism can be dangerous because, number one, it promotes unbiblical standards. An example of that is uh, some churches teach that men shouldn't have long hairs or birds, while women shouldn't have short hair. Some churches do that. Number two, it promotes personal performance. It says, I do or do not do, whereas the Bible says, I cannot do, but Jesus did. Number three, it demotes Jesus. Legalism says that people can merit God's favor outside of Christ's work. This implies that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection either were not enough or not necessary. And number four, it distorts the gospel. Legalism <laughs> distorts the truth of the gospel by adding requirements to salvation by grace through faith. So legalism are weights that we carry that hinders our walk with the Lord. Okay, so that is let us lay aside everywhere and let us lay aside the sin which clings so closely. Just recently in our Disciple Essentials training, we just finished that topic. See, Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And verses 6, uh, 323 says that for the way for the wages of sin is death, but the gift, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Because of sin, our relationship with God was cut off, resulting to a spiritual death and had a crack in our relationship to ourselves and to others. There are a lot of things that were mentioned in the Bible, particularly in the book of Colossians and Galatians. Let me just read to you one example. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 19, to 21 it says now the work of the flesh are evident sexual immorality impurity sensuality idolatry sorcery enmity strife jealousy fits of anger rivalry dissensions divisions envy drunkenness orgies and things like this there were 15 of them that were mentioned in this verse alone. And sexual immorality is one of them. Six, oh, sex is good, designed by God only for a husband and wife. Outside of marriage, it is called immorality, which is cheap. Wine is also good. They use it in celebration for enjoyment. In fact, Jesus turned water into wine. In John uh, chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. But when it is uh, consumed excessively, that is drunkenness. 
Drunkenness is dangerous. When you get drunk, you have no control on it. It controls you. It controls you. So what's slowing you down in the Christian race? Lay aside anything that dulls your interest in God. Lay aside anything that keeps you from the Bible. Lay aside anything that harms your testimony. Lay aside anything that keeps you out of the church. Weights and sins are worth the risk of losing the race. So let us lay aside the sin which clings so closely. And the third, let us, says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Jesus has set race for us. As I said a while ago, it's not a spring, it's not a dust, it's a marathon. The Christian life is a lifelong race. And it requires endurance. To endure a race, you need a lot of energy, a lot of training, a lot of self-discipline, a lot of patience and commitment. Co commit commitment to what? To finish the race. You don't run a race and quit half of the race. It's no longer a marathon, it's a half marathon. <laughs> <laughs> so, commitment is needed when you run the race. You need to finish it because Jesus is with you. Jesus is with us from the starting line and to the finish line. Not only from the start, then to the finish line, but every step from the starting line to the finish line, Jesus is there with us. Okay, so we must look around us, we must look within us, and the third one, and the most important one, we must look to Jesus. In verse 2 it says, looking to Jesus, or fixing our eyes to Jesus. When I was uh, just uh, a teenager, because my father is a farmer. He teaches me all the works in the field. My brother too, because he will be with us today. My father teaches us the work on the field, from preparing the field until the harvest. He teaches us all those work. But the hardest part that my father teaches me was plowing the field. When I plow the field, in the Philippines, when you plow a field, you use a, manual, a plow, not a tractor, a plow being pulled by a water buffalo. So when my father teached me how to plow, I was looking on my steps and I was looking on the plow. And when I see back, the way I plow, it was going like this. It's not going straight. And my dad told me, my father told me, don't look on your step, don't you? Don't look on the plow. Look far back. Look at that tree, that tree, the, that very far tree over there. Fix your eyes on that tree and let the water buffalo follow 
那阿修嘎耶提，就啊，对，你知不知道为哪个？哦呀，冰肉 ，I got it <laughs>。So that's how I learn Lao. The same way in the race, the runner does not look at his feet. He does not look on his left and on his side. To see other players where they are, because if they do, they that will cause them to stumble. What he does is focus his eyes on the finish line, where the prize is. In the Christian life, it's the same way. We have to focus. Our eyes on Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is the author and perfecter, or the founder and per perfecter of our faith. Some translation says the author and finisher of our faith. But what does it mean to be the author and finisher? Of our faith, Jesus being the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. It means that His faithfulness ensures that He will be with believers until Jesus returns, and that's what the Apostle Paul said in Philippians verse one. Uh, out of chapter one, verse six, where he says, "And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ." <laughs> And Jesus confirms that, confirms that on the cross when he said, "It is finished." So verse two continues, where it says, "Who for the joy that was set before us, or before him, endured the cross." When Jesus went to the cross, he did not see joy on the cross itself. In fact, he saw agony. On the cross, on the night before he was betrayed, he pleaded to the Father and told him, "If there is any way to rescue mankind, then let this cup pass from me. Let this cup pass." For me, but there was no other way. There was no other way. So Jesus embraced the cross. He didn't enjoy on the cross itself, but beyond the cross, what he has accomplished on the cross. Did you see that joy that Jesus had on the cross? It was you, 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 and me. It was all of us. Jesus endured the agony of the cross because of the promised reward that we will be with Him. That we will be with him. So what he accomplished on the cross is the one that gives him joy. And then the verse continues. It says, "Despise the shame. Despise the shame." When I was 
trying to uh, study this preaching of mine when I came to this phrase, despise the shame. I was so touched. I was so touched. Did you know that when the Romans crucify somebody, they crucify him naked? Did you know that? When I look on the, the four, four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all of them, they say, they strip the garments of Jesus and they cast out on his garment. The book of uh, John, let me uh, show you, is the clearest that mentioned that Jesus was crucified naked. Look, or oh, rather John, John chapter 19 verses 23 up to 24. Says here, when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts. One part for each soldier and also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lot. Do you know what a tonic is? When I Google what a tonic is, it is an undergarment next to the skin. So they took his garment, even his tunic, they took it. So what would you see? Jesus was crucified, naked. We don't know that, even I, I didn't know that. We only know it because of what we see on pictures of Jesus Christ. We cover him, movies, the movies. What a shame. When Romans crucify somebody, they will do everything that they will do to humiliate the person. So that's how they do it. But Jesus despised the shame. He knew it. He forget it. He don't care about it. It's because of his love. <coughs> because of his love for us. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, was crucified naked. And his father was pleased with what Jesus has did on the cross. Jesus had also faith in God. God was pleased with Jesus' faith. The Godman, Jesus had faith in God the Father. That's why the father said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And without faith, the Bible says, it is impossible to please God. It is impossible to please God. Okay, let's go to the last part. Jesus is our ultimate example. Jesus, when he ascended, 
to heaven, he showed us a lot of his attributes as an example for us to follow. I just selected some attributes of God as an example for us to follow. Endure suffering. We just know how Jesus suffered on the cross. He did that because of his love for us. How about you? Can you endure suffering? Not the same case just like Jesus did. Many people around us laugh at us and they ridicule us. But can you endure the shame? Can you endure the suffering? Second, be compassionate. Jesus showed many kinds or many ways. He showed his compassion in so many ways. By healing, feeding, forgiving, teaching. Those are the things that Jesus did. He healed the sick, feed the hungry, forgive the sinners. It's just when he wisdom. And the next one, be generous. God is so generous that he gave his son as our Savior. Could you give or help somebody who is in need? And number four, invest your life to others. Jesus in his last three years on earth, he invested his life teaching, preaching, and training his disciples how to live a life of faith. And he teaches them to make disciples. Before he left them for the last time, he said to them in Matthew 28, verses 19, or 18, part of, part of 18 to 20. He said, all authorities in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, make disciples in all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And therefore, I will be with you to the very ends of so in verse 3, it says, consider, consider him, it means Jesus, who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you, you may not grow weary or faint, faint-hearted. So brothers and sisters in the Lord, the race of faith calls for great endurance. Winners always start and end well. Winners give their all throughout the race. And joy awaits winners at the end of the race. At the end of the race, when we see Jesus face to face, we will hear him say, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Father in heaven, thank you for the message that you have given us today. I pray, O oh Lord, that we will finish the Christian race in Jesus' name. I pray.
Amen. 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 Amen.